Hi, everyone. Uh, today, I'll talk about uh, spider venoms, uh, their evolutionary history, their myths surrounding them, and uh, how they all came to be. Uh, this work was majorly done with Professor Kathir Sunagar uh, at his lab, uh, the evolutionary venoms lab, as Mike mentioned, uh, at the Indian Institute of Science. Um, I'll just briefly introduce uh, spiders to, to you all. Uh, spiders, also known as Arenia, have evolved in this uh, absolutely fascinating group of animals called as Arachnida, alongside scorpions, solchugi, and pigs. Uh, they have evolved around 500 million years ago in the uh, famous Cambrian era. Uh, they are a very unique lineage uh, with uh, silk and venom as a as a tool to hunt. Uh, this also makes them one of the most uh, uh, top predator of uh, terrestrial predator. Uh, modern spiders could be largely classified into two types, uh, the Arinomorphi and the Megalomorphi. Uh, Arinomorphi being the small uh, colorful spiders that one would usually see in a garden or a bed uh, while Megalomorphi have the infamous tarantulas, and if you were to go around some deep forest, you'll we'll definitely uh, encounter a couple of tarantulas in your world. Um, definitely, if you talk about venom, we have to talk about their venom systems. Uh, so, you know, we don't know a lot about spider venom systems, but recently a lot of, a lot of it has been uncovered uh, by works uh, by both uh, Tim and uh, Julia. So if you look at spider venom, uh, both the Arinomorphe and Megalomorphe have a different sort of arrangement for the venom sacs. Uh, the Megalomorphe have the more traditional downward pointing fangs, uh, while the invention of a painting like mechanism here uh, in, oh, let me just get my pointer. The pencil like mechanism here in Arinomorphe, uh, this is the evolutionary invention which uh, gave them uh, the ability to, to prey upon multiple prey and uh, with regards of what size it is. Uh, we also know through recent evidence that venom gland uh, in spiders originates at the base of the chalicera. So if this were the fang, it actually originates here. And it, this, this, this happens quite early in the development systems. And eventually as the spider grows up, the venom gland migrates from the uh, Salicaria back into their head and actually occupies a large section of their head. So if you were to look uh, in Arinomorphe, the, the tiny spice that you see, uh, most of their head is occupied by their venom gland. Now that they have such a well-defined venom system, all, most if not all spiders are venomous. Uh, that does mean that if the spider bites you, uh, although they're not uh, medically relevant to humans, a spider bite could be fairly treated with first aid, simple first aid techniques. Their pen uh, mostly contains of a single scaffold or a single uh, family of proteins called as lysopyridis peptides. Uh, if you can see on your uh, right side, there are some illustrations of how they look. Uh, they account for roughly about 80% to 90% of those type of venom. Uh, the rest then is uh, populated by enzymes and polyamines and salts, but not very dominant. So what are DRPs? DRPs are basically a class of uh, biotype peptides which contains a lot of cysteines and then the cysteines come together to form a cysteine bridge. Uh, they're present uh, throughout the tree of life in plants, uh, in animal, uh, in fungi, and they have different functions in each lineage. Uh, it could be a growth hormone, it could be uh, an antibacterial peptide, but in case of spiders, uh, it's as a venom, and we'll largely focus on knotels. It's a type of dinosaurid peptide which forms a knot using using the cysteine bonds. And if you look at uh, ICK here, it's one of the most uh, common uh, and prevalent uh, type of cysteine knot in spider venoms. Uh, these venoms have largely evolved to target uh, ion channels, being small in nature, and also gives away uh, why most symptoms of a spider bite are neurotoxic neuro neuro in nature. That which means that they either have pain or inflammation in the local area. But if you were to look at uh, the RP in the context of spider venom, uh, if you look at the alignment, you see that there is they almost share no homology among them, uh, except for the cysteines that are highlighted here in uh, orange. Uh, these are necessarily that are structurally important, uh, help the protein to form a proper fold uh, and make the core of the protein. But if you look at the outside part of the protein, it's it's highly diverse from each other and there is no homology. This highlights a very uh, fascinating evolutionary fact that evolution is acting on the structure of the protein to retain the scaffold, but not on the sequence of the protein. So if one were to uh, study them, it becomes a, it's a challenge to look at them. But if you were to uh, zoom in a bit, and if you were to make small groups of these peptides, uh, you will find that uh, some groups do have shared homology. If you look at group one and group four here, 
some of them do have a homologous region, but most of them will not have any homology as you can see here. But again, if you look closely, uh, cysteines that are again in orange are conserved throughout. And this is the one that uh, give the structural property to all these DRPs. So if one were to study, uh, you would have to zoom out a bit uh, and would have to look at the gene as a whole structure to look at uh, DRPs or these peptides that are highly diversified. Uh, this is the point where I would like to introduce uh, a term called a subfamily of proteins. Uh, in context of venom, this was uh, first used by Sandy, Sandy Pineda in 2014, when they were looking at insert toxins, uh, which are one of the most deadliest toxins for most in tarantulas. Uh, what they found is that typical to a structure of a family in venoms as well, you find a, a single peptide region which is strongly conserved. Downstream to that, you would find a couple of more types of single peptide region which could be homologous or not. And then followed by that, we have a huge plethora of uh, disability peptide matcher peptides which uh, do not uh, necessarily share any homology. So if you quickly look at the example here that I have put, uh, we have conserved uh, homology, uh, we have a homologous uh, single peptide region for all these three groups. To downside of that, we have uh, three examples of proprietary regions. One, where they're all, uh, where there, there, is, there is no short homology between them, while this other case where they have a small homology between them. This points out that uh, this is a very uh, unique practice, which leads, which enables peptides to have a uh, large number of, or accumulate large number of changes, and also be still packaged and folded nicely. So that leads to the problem statement of this entire work of uh, how and when did DRPs come to be in spider venom and what drove this evolution. Uh, the story begins uh, with my master's thesis uh, with Dr. Karthik, uh, where we were trying, as just like as Pineda, we were also trying to look at the evolution of hexatoxins uh, because of their medical relevance. Um, what we interestingly find out that if you look at just hexatoxin, it seems that all of them share a common origin. Uh, and uh, interestingly, when we uh, included a novel members in them, uh, we found that even members of unrelated spiders showed signatures of them uh, having a common origin. Uh, but this was uh, this was during my master thesis, and unfortunately, COVID um, happened, and then we couldn't continue. But eventually, Karthik invited me to be uh, a research associate in the lab, and we were able to continue the work. Now that uh, we had this background uh, knowledge, we tried to zoom out a bit and we tried to look at vision of DRPs as a whole in all of spiders. So we tried to sample more and more uh, specimens from across the lineage to get uh, accurate representatives uh, and enough data. And luckily we were able to found uh, some novel families as shown here. And we were able to do all sort of phylogenetic and evolutionary analysis on them uh, to answer their origin and evolution. So quickly jump into results. Um, I'll talk, go a bit slower to the results part. Mm, if you were to look at megalomorphs, the tarantulas, uh, we found some 33 novel toxin, toxin families here. And when we built a phylogenetic analysis, we found that most of them do share a common origin. If you were to look at the figure on your right, uh, each tip or each line that represents here, it represents one, one toxin family. And each dot uh, on the top corresponds to a genus of spider. Uh, this pattern seems to, seems to tell us that uh, in case of uh, megalomorphy or tarantulas, uh, there seems to be that each unique uh, genus of spider has its own unique uh, signature of venom. And when we looked at arimimorphy, the smaller spiders, we found some 38 novel families, of, of course, with the evidence that they all are evolving uh, from a common ancestor. But again, if you were to focus on the figure, you see that each tip, which is a family, and each dot of the genus, it looks like there is a shared... Uh, venom across the lineages. Uh, each venom type is sh shared among multiple families or multiple genus of spiders, uh, which also alludes to the fact that these uh, small spiders are having a shared or a um, or scattered form of venom evolution. When we uh, looked at these both toxins together, uh, the mycolomorphy one and the animorphy one, what we found was that both of them indeed have a shared common origin in their ancestor. Uh, we call this the uh, thing as in a single common ancestral origin for spiders. Uh, we name this as Adi Shakti, the hypothesis, uh, which uh, in Hindi mythology translates to the uh, or, uh, the creator of the all diversity. And we believe that the common and the common ancestral primordial knot, which gave rise to all this diversity, uh, is responsible for uh, all the spiders very much that we see today. Uh, based on some uh, data, we can also Hypothesize when this recruitment could have happened. Uh, it, it could have happened around three certain years ago uh, in the common lineage of all extant spiders today. Uh, and it also tells us that 
even though it was one single scaffold, uh, multiple events and rounds of linear specific duplication events and diversification, diversification of these peptides give rise to the entire pass um, loss that we have today. But now that we know how uh, they have recruited, we were also interested uh, in looking uh, on what was the molecular regime that acts on them and what evolutionary uh, factors affect uh, the course of evolution of these peptides in spider venom. So when we uh, assess their molecular evolution, uh, we found that uh, fascinatingly, the, the smaller spiders, the early morphe, or the venom is strongly conserved uh, as, com as opposed to in megalomorphe, where their venom uh, is largely under positive selection. Uh, I'll explain selection in a bit. Uh, for, like, if you look at omega here, omega is basically the rate of non select non substitution happening in a protein sequence. So if you would have more non synonymous substitutions, you would be diversifying faster and the value would go much above one. And uh, if your protein was supposed to uh, be evolving slower and accumulating less non synonymous substitutions, then the value would be much lower than one. So if you look at the tarantula as a mega market here, it seems that they are actually diversifying much faster as compared to their counterparts. We tried to look at this from a different ecological perspective to see if ecology could answer uh, how these venoms are evolving and why the contrast in both. So what we found is that if you look at venoms uh, which are involved in uh, offense or predation, uh, these are, are evolving under a higher selection pressure. They are diversifying faster. While opposed to, if you look at uh, peptides of families that are involved in defense, then they are evolving slower. Uh, this alludes to the most famous law of evolution uh, of the red pill hypothesis, where uh, enzymes or predators are always in a constant race to gain edge over their prey, uh, while uh, the defensive toxins or the defensive measures uh, are sticking to the broadly active, um, well tested um, phenomena. But now that we had uh, answers towards how uh, the molecular evolution works in this uh, and that they have a common origin, we wanted to go back and answer if we could, uh, if we could find a way to explain or to find a possible explanation of why we see such different recruitment patterns both in the and necrotic toxins. So we came to a few scenarios that could pause even plausible explanation. Uh, the first one uh, could be that uh, both megalomorphic and arenomorphic could have recruited these uh, scaffolds at a different rate, uh, at a different point of the speciation events. Uh, in megalomorphic, it seems that uh, each each center of the lineage recruited, the, recruited a particular scaffold uh, at its origin, while in, in arenomorphic, it seems that uh, the recruitment happened at the level of equality to lineage families. So each family has a signature of venom, which is shared among its members. Uh, which is opposed to megalomorphy, where it's each uh, individual genus which has its own unique uh, unique picture of venom. Uh, the other fact could be the rate of diversification. Uh, we know that uh, megalomorphic venoms are evolving much faster compared to the arenomorphy venom. So it could be that even though these both uh, were recruited at a similar point down the history of the evolution, it's just the fact that the uh, one of them is evolving much faster could give a rise to a different uh, picture altogether at the end while we look at it. And to remember that this is just a snapshot in the history of evolution, it could be that this could change after a while. All this paints a very unique picture of weaponization in spiders, where it seems that they have included only one scaffold and uh, at, the, at their ancestor, which is uh, here near Office of And it seems that they have, uh, through multiple uh, events of duplication and uh, diversification, have given rise to the current venom arsenal that they have. Uh, this is quite the contrast. Uh, to snakes, uh, as Mike mentioned, is one of the most uh, well studied when it was lineage, where it seems that snakes have recruited multiple scaffolds or enzymes throughout the evolution and then have brought them to be part of the venom. Uh, this, this also alludes to the fact that where each venom component has its own independent event of diversification and duplication, which could give us a unique such, uh, signature of each venom lineage, uh, each snake lineage. So if you just have to compare both of these uh, side by side, uh, it shows that one where one lineage focuses on innovation, the other lineage focuses on recruitment. And this basically highlights how different strategies of innovation and recruitment and definition of venoms could give rise to novel venom systems or novel venom factors throughout the animal life. And we know that there's more than 100 events of uh, evolution of venom. And I'm sure that more as a more and more we study, we just said there's new ways and pathways of uh, recruitment could be known to us. Uh, towards the end of my talk, uh, if there were a few takeaways that I would like you to have, that would be the first. Uh, all spider toxins, a majority of them share a common origin, which is the same rich in nature. Uh, Arrhenia morphe, megalomorphe, though they have the same uh, 
uh, same time put skills capital the same time put they have adopted a different strategy of diversification and recruitment in their venom uh, which always is reflected by reflected in their venom profiles the, the role of ecology uh, be it food uh, or a diet or defensive or of the nature of the of the venom itself shapes has a large role to play in how the venoms evolve uh, and uh, the final one thing that different strategies of, of innovation or recruitment or duplication events uh, could give rise to novel uh, animal use uh, or novel animal apparatus harboring venoms mm, by the end i'd like to thank uh, dr kartik sunagar for giving me this opportunity and vivek and sanjeev for helping me during the initial time of my thesis and everyone at uh, evil and isc for making it a wonderful time thank you Thank you very much, Naeem. As always, if the audience have any questions, you can feel free to ask them directly or write them in the chat. And while we are waiting for the first question, I will start with one. And my first one is, when you showed the, the venom system, it looks mm -hmm. like that the right and the left venom glands are different, or is it just... Wait, I'll just Based go back. On the... I'll just go back to that. Mm -hmm. These? Yeah. Uh, no, the, the same venom system, it's just that uh, the arrangement is different. So uh, the ancestral spiders or even the primitive spiders have a downward facing uh, arrangement of venom, as in the tarantulas here. But I no, I mean on the, the other side on the page because oh, it's oh, sorry, sorry, colored here? differently on the left on, and on the right side. Oh, no. These are just uh, expression. Uh, so this was the common house spider. And uh, these here are expression profiles of throughout the course of, throughout the course of development of spider, ontogeny wise, and how uh, it's it's traveling from the uh, base of uh, base of the fang towards the, uh, of, uh, towards the head region. Okay, but there's no difference between left and right. No, no, no. no. It's the oh, same okay. pattern, just just how it's developing. Just two different studies. So. And my second question would be you compared the sequences of the different um spider toxins against each other. Did you have the chance also to look into the gene sequences? Or is yes, there so not so much DNA samples from the spiders? No, so these the, these are DNA sequences. Uh, we looked at DNA sequences and then translated them to to protein. But uh -huh. all the analysis were were done on DNA itself. So just protein is easier easier to visualize and it's easier to show that where the cysteines are conserved as opposed to in DNA. Ah, okay. So the comparison was made on DNA level, but just yes, for the yes. figures, it was then translated figures for the... translated. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There's one quick question. Um, I don't know if it's um. I don't know if it's within your research scope, but which are the most common spiders in your region and how is their venom diversity? Uh, in, in this region, uh, we, we would have a lot of, uh, uh, we don't have the hexathlete here. They are restricted to the Australian uh, continent, uh, but this applies to spiders throughout uh, like the global diversity. Uh, we have reports from India, Australia, uh, Europe. So this, most of the data came from uh, Databases. It was not just generated by us, so it also accounted for uh, the diversity in my area and across the world. I hope I answered. And no big uh, question which, until now, so I think it's fine. What is the common spiders in 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 uh, in my region? I, I think I've, I've only seen uh, really morphia and jumping like the jumping spiders mostly where I live around. Uh, but it, uh, like if you were to go in the uh, Western Ghats of India, you would see some tarantulas there. 